Is everybody happy? Yeah. I've noticed um, when I come to events such as this that people on the pro-life side of, of life are happy and that people on the other side of life are always going around, right? And maybe, maybe there's a reason. Um, yes, I uh, moved here actually after 67 plus years from California. Uh, there's white stuff here that flows out of the sky. Uh, I, I, I didn't quite understand what it was, but I knew I wasn't in California anymore the other day when I watched the geese on the Potomac River and they were walking on the river instead of swimming in it. <laughs> and also, by the way, I've come to realize that the swamp is very real. Uh, I have never, I, I've never lived, frankly, in such an interesting, fascinating place that is so completely insane. It's, it's uh, really bad. Well, I, I, I should get to it because uh, Georgette gave me 30 minutes, and as she said, I'm a lawyer. It, you know, it takes me that long to clear my throat, <laughs> but we'll get to it. Um, I'm going to talk about human exceptionalism. I, um, I, I just want to state very briefly what, it, what I, how I conceive that term, and, and there are two sides to the term human exceptionalism. One has to do with the sanctity of human life, the unique value of human life, the inestimable, uh, uh, incalculable value of human life. So people would say, well, why don't you just talk about the sanctity of life? Well, because that's not the only thing. There's another side. The other side of that coin is that we are the only species in the known universe that have moral duties. We are the only species in the moral universe, in the, in the known universe, that understand right versus wrong. So we have duties to ourselves. We have duties to our posterity. When the founding fathers created this great nation, they often wrote about the posterity. That's us. And we have, as much as they considered us in their work, we have to consider those who will come later in our work. We have duties to treat animals humanely, which is different than animal rights, which is a whole nother speech. Uh, we, have different, we have duties to treat the earth in the proper way, proper stewardship, which is different than a radical environmental approach which sees human beings as the cancer on the planet. So human exceptionalism covers, I think, the full uh, array of what it means to be human and the importance of being human. And in terms of rejecting human exceptionalism, uh, when you get into issues such as healthcare, bioethics, how we treat the weak and vulnerable. Uh, if we accept or reject human exceptionalism, you'll end up in different places. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I often wonder, uh, I'm not wonder, but I often want to start speeches such as this uh, to try to help people understand something that has happened that many are often not aware of, and I certainly wasn't for a long time. Uh, I got into the anti-euthanasia work 25 years ago. My first it's hard for me to believe. My first anti-euthanasia article was published in Newsweek magazine on June 28, 1993. And I, I wrote it after a friend of mine killed herself under the influence of Hemlock Society literature, proselytizing for suicide. And I was so upset by the, the despicable material she had in her suicide file uh, I remember it was called the Hemlock Quarterly, and, and it would teach people the drugs to take, how to use a plastic bag to kill yourself, and proselytizing stories. I remember one to this day, because Francis, my friend, had underscored it in yellow ink. My loved one laughed and giggled and seemed to relish the experience. That sound you heard was my head exploding, because the laughing and the giggling and the relishing had to do with committing suicide had to do with a, a person whose loved one killed themselves, extolling the idea. And my friend Francis had fallen into this trap of Hemlock Society belief. Well, the Hemlock Society still exists today. You don't hear about them because they're not as honest about their purpose. They've changed their name to Compassion and Choices. But it's still the old Hemlock Society. It's still the old idea of poison pills for people who are sick, people who are disabled, and so forth. But I always used to ask myself the why now question. Once I got into this, which I had not planned to, <laughs> the Lord has his own ideas, doesn't he? Uh, once you, I, I, I would say, why now? You know, 100 years ago, if somebody developed appendicitis, for example, they could die in agony. If somebody had bone cancer, they could die in agony. 
And yet, 100 years ago, you didn't see any talk, very tiny, maybe often some kind of weird corner, of euthanasia, death with dignity. You know, my dad died in a hospice of cancer. My mother died of Alzheimer's in my home. They were not poisoned to death. Was that not dignity? Being cared for and loved to their last breath? Isn't that dignity? Death with dignity, being poisoned with a lethal jab or swallowing 100 pills with applesauce to make sure you don't regurgitate it, possibly going into uh, 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 seizures or extended coma. That's not dignity. That's doing away with the problem. That's kind of discarding people at their time of extremists. And when people uh, commit assisted suicide, the, the people I look at as responsible are not the despairing person, but the people around them who supported the idea, who should have been there to say no. I don't want you to do that. I love you. Here's what we can do for you. That's caring. That's love. Saying, oh, you want to kill yourself? Well, that's your choice. If my mother had said to me, you know, I know I've got Alzheimer's. I'm very ill. I'm going to die, you know, in, in some period of time. Maybe I should have assisted suicide. And I'd said, oh, well, it's your, it's your choice, Mom. That would have made her want to kill herself. Because she would have believed that I no longer loved her, that her life was no longer worth living, that she was a burden. We hear that an awful lot, don't we? How do people think they're a burden? Because we've let them think that they're a burden. So the not why now question was, uh, was uh, uh, always upon me. And then I read a, a little book uh, called Imagining the Future, which is actually about the stem cell issue, which we're not going to discuss today, by Yuval Levin. Yuval Levin is a, uh, he's out here, one of the sane ones. <laughs> um, he was a, a staffer on the President's Council on Bioethics. He's a, a protege of Leon Cass, the great bioethicist. And he wrote this in, this in this book, and it answered the why now question for me. And I think it's important for you all to, or as we say in Virginia, y'all, <laughs> I think it's important for, uh, for you to understand what's happened to our society because it will help you understand how people could say the most awful things and think they're being good. He wrote about this Descartes, and he said, Descartes was awfully bold in describing health as without doubt the primary good and the foundation of, of other goods of this life. Surely the claim that health is a primary good has consequences well beyond the agenda of the scientist. What a beautiful sound. Any society's understanding of the foundational good necessarily gives shape to its politics, its social institutions, and its sense of moral purpose and direction. How you live has a lot to do with what you strive for. And health is an unusual candidate for the primary good. It is surely an essential good. Without health, not much else can be enjoyed. But Descartes' formulation in the worldview of modern science is health is not only as a, sees health not only as a foundation, but also a principal goal, not only as a beginning, but also an end, and this is the key. Relief and preservation from disease and pain, from misery and necessity, become the defining ends of human action and therefore human societies. So what Yuval wrote here, and it made sense, it was the I could have had, should have had a V8 moment. He is saying that the purpose of society has shifted. Your purpose, as you see society, is to protect innocent human life, preserve innocent human life, protect the vulnerable and protect the weak, and palliate the suffering. What many people now believe is that the primary purpose of human, suffer of human society is to eliminate suffering. And once you accept that eliminating suffering is the prime directive, that very quickly metastasizes into eliminating the sufferer. And then something else happens. The very concept of what suffering means becomes incredibly elastic. So in my own life, for example, uh, my mother dying of Alzheimer's disease. My mother suffered, yes. I suffered. I suffered, of course I suffered. My wife suffered as we dealt with this uh, terrible affliction. Some would say that the medical team that had to help my mother suffered because it's not easy to deal with a very elderly woman uh, who's going through the throes of Alzheimer's. And it's not just loss of memory, if any of you have had people close to you who died of it. The loss of memory is the least of it. And others would say, 
and I could, I could uh, give you chapter and verse, uh, don't have time, that society suffers because of the burden of the cost of care. And so if we're going to eliminate suffering, it moves even beyond eliminating the sufferer. It starts to move towards pushing out and, and limiting the, the uh, acceptance of people who are expensive to care for or people who make, us, make it difficult for us to, uh, in terms of our own emotional lives. And it becomes incredibly dangerous. And you end up in a completely different society from one that protects life to one that is willing to take it in a higher cause of making sure there's no suffering. And of course, on the abortion issue, you've got the flip side because not suffering also means get it, giving me what gives me satisfaction, right? And so you have abortion and you have some other things that are happening in terms of lifestyle desires and so forth that are becoming almost sanctified in our society. And it all flows, in my view, from this shift. And so when you're out there discussing these issues with people who may not agree with you, it may be because they're coming from a, a, a different first thing. And understanding that, I think, can help you deal with it so that you can engage people in a conversation that hopefully will plant some seeds that can lead to uh, a, a redemption, if you will. Because that's what's needed. That's what's needed. So in the, in the field of bioethics, the problem, bioethics is a contraction for biomedical ethics, and it is a field of a moral philosophy uh, that uh, presumes to uh, decide what is the proper approach for healthcare law, for medical ethics, and so forth. Doctors uh, back in the 60s kind of abdicated their role uh, in terms of medical ethics and gave it to the experts, right? Who well, are the experts? Uh, by the way, a bioethicist does not have to be licensed. A barber has to be licensed, <laughs> but, but a bio, I, when I tell bioethicists that, they get very angry at me. You know? <laughs> you know, a barber has to be alive, but a bio, I'm, so, you know, I'm often called a bioethicist. I, I don't call myself that, but I've never taken a course in bioethics. I deal with common sense. I'm a lawyer, as you, thanks for not holding it against me. Um, but if you, if you take, if you take a premise, you can, you can, trace out where that's going to lead because we're also a logical species. We're going to take an idea where it takes us and, and that's what happens. So if you ha in bioethics, the sanctity of human life in the mainstream of the, of the area is not what matters. It's much more utilitarian. So unless a bioethicist has a modifier in front of his or her name, such as a conservative bioethicist, an Anglican bioethicist, a ca Catholic bioethicist, generally speaking, they're going to hold to the view that I'm going to describe, either to a greater or lesser degree. And what they believe in is what is sometimes called undignified bioethics, by which they mean we do not believe in the sanctity and intrinsic dignity of human life. I once was uh, early in, I, I wrote a book called Culture of Death, The Age of Do Harm Medicine, which uh, deals with these issues at greater length. And I was invited to the University of Virginia uh, t on a panel, and th this was on C-SPAN, so I'm discussing this stuff, uh, some of which I'll, I'll describe to you. Now, this was several years ago, but, um, and the uh, usual suspects were there, and they didn't actually counter me. And as soon as the cameras were off, they surrounded me and they started yelling at me. And some of them were trembling, saying, how can you say that human beings have intrinsic value? That's speciesist. I said, what? That's speciesist. That's discrimination against animals. And I'm not kidding. So let me, let me get to it because of the time factor. This is uh, one of the most interesting Speciesism, it's also in the animal rights movement, Spe movement. speciesism. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a spe, oh, it's, uh, uh. anyway, you see why my hair's this color. <laughs> uh, so so there, was a, there was an interesting article, one that I, I found extremely helpful in my work, um, from the journal Bioethics, and, and by the way, much of this discussion occurs above the public awareness. 
because the popular media doesn't cover what's being written about in the professional journals or being uh, discussed in the symposia and so forth. And a lot of policies are top-down directed. For the example, the, the old eugenics movement, which is coming back again, you know, good and birth, the fit versus the unfit, that started at the high academy and was imposed down on society until we had non involuntary sterilization. You're seeing the same kind of thing here with bioethics. A so part of what I do, by the way, if you want to see what's going wrong in the country, read the professional journals. So what I try to do is see what's going on in the journals and bring it down and, and write about it in, in popular media so people be, will be aware of what is being planned for them. Because when it's, it's, you turn on the light and the, and the cockroaches scurry. Uh, because the more light you shine on these things, the less likely, likely it is to happen because bioethics is a worldview, and again, I'm talking the mainstream, that seeks to impose values on a people who don't share those views. So while I don't think we can win these discussions in the ivory tower, I know we can win them on Main Street if we can get people's attention off of Kim Kardashian. So this is, uh, this is uh, an article called uh, uh, Undignified Bioethics, and it's by a fellow named Alastair Cochrane. And it, for those who may want to look it up, December 2009 in the journal Bioethics. And Cochrane talks about dignity, and, and at first he, he discusses dignity as a behavior, because of course dignity has different meanings. So, uh, you know, there are, there are ways that all of us can act undignified. Just ask my wife when I dance with her, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a way of being undignified. The Three Stooges, woo, mo, woo, 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 right? You know, the men like that, the men are smiling, the women are going, oh, bullet, you know. <laughs> so, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the intrinsic value of each and every one of us that is equal and inherent. And uh, so um, Cochrane uh, says this, the second important conception of dignity that we need to consider does not see dignity as a form of behavior, but as property, as a property. Under this conception, the possession of dignity by humans signifies that they have an inherent moral worth. This is so well written, I wish I'd written it. In other words, because human beings possess dignity, we cannot do what we like to them. Indeed, but instead have direct moral obligations toward them. That's human exceptionalism. Indeed, this understanding of dignity is also usually considered to serve as the grounding for human rights. As Article I of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, all humans are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And it is absolutely true. If we reject human exceptionalism, throw uh, universal human rights away, because if human beings do not have equal moral worth as an objective factor, but have to prove their worth through some subjective criteria, then some people are going to get it in the neck, and universal human rights cease to be universal. Universal. In fact, I would suggest that you won't have human rights. You will have, as we will get to, I hope I have time to get to it, person rights. Okay? So, so you can see the stakes here. Cochrane goes on to say, the concept of dignity and inherent moral worth certainly seems coherent enough as an idea. Yeah. Indeed, we can see why this conception of dignity is employed in certain debates around bioethics. For if all individual human beings possess dignity, then they should not be viewed simply as resources, Planned Parenthood, that we can treat however we please. To take an example then, it, might, it may be that we could achieve rapid and significant progress in medical science if we were to conduct wide-ranging medical experiments on groups of human beings. However, because human beings have dignity, so it is argued, this means that they possess a particular quality that grounds certain moral obligations and rights. Human exceptionalism is crucial. He has stated it as well as it can be stated. It is undeniable, it seems to me, that if you reject what he's discussing, which he does, by the way, then we're going to be in a whole world where the strong victimize the weak. And it won't be on racial lines this time. It'll be on health and disability and uh, being prenatal or being uh, like my mother with Alzheimer's, okay? 
And he goes on to say, if all human beings possess dignity, this extraordinary moral worth, we need some explanation of what it is about the species Homo sapiens that makes them so deserving. When we start looking at particular characteristics that might ground dignity, language use, moral action, society, sociality, sentience, self-consciousness, and so on, we soon see that none of these qualities are in fact possessed by each and every human. We are thereby left wondering why all human beings actually do possess dignity. This is what I call the philosopher and the dupe. This is the game that's played. So let's say I say, okay, what makes human beings Beyond, you know, we're created in the likeness and image of God. Someone says, okay, I don't believe in God. Well, where do you go next, right? <laughs> you have to have, be able to have a conversation. So if, you, if, if you're talking in a religious context, be, that's easy to discuss. But if you're talking to atheists, it's not so easy to discuss. And we can't just say, okay, well, if you're atheist, you're going go to go you know, to perdition. We have to bring people into human exceptionalism regardless of their faith concepts or their faith beliefs. So let's say we say, um, all right, only human beings are capable of understanding right versus wrong. That's, that's a moral value that, in, 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 then they will say, yes, but not every human being can do that. Because some are premature, too premature, you know? Uh, I, I would say it's in human nature. And if it isn't being expressed, it's either because they're too premature, they're gestating, right? But it's certainly in, in the package and if somebody does not have a, a concept of right and wrong, we call them a psychopath, and they're, they're, they're badly damaged, or they're premature, such as infants, or they're like my mother, who eventually lost those capacities due to illness or injury, Terry Schiavo, another example. So, so what he's saying is, well, since every human being doesn't possess moral value, uh, moral uh, uh, capacity to, to think morally, then those who do not possess those capacities have to be lower than those that do. And our answer is no, we're a package deal. None of us is abandoned. They, this is part of human nature and we all have that capacity unless it is prevented from expressing at some point, but it is still within the package. And I don't care when my mother was on her deathbed in a coma, she still had those capacities. She was still a human being. She was equal to me. And in fact, if anything, she had a greater claim to my commitment and my love than a lesser one. So he goes on, obviously given controversies over abortion, stem cell research, genetic interventions, animal experimentations, euthanasia, and so on, bioethics does need to engage in debates over which entities, that's how they discuss these things, which entities <coughs> uh, possess moral worth and why. But these are best conducted by using the notion of moral status and arguing over the characteristics that warrant possession of it, simply stipulating that all and only human beings possess this inherent moral worth because they have dignity is arbitrary and unhelpful. Yeah, it's unhelpful if you want to take somebody like Terry Schiavo and kill her for her organs. It's definitely unhelpful. And that's being proposed in bioethics literature and in some of the most prominent uh, medical journals in the world. It is not being done, but it is being proposed. It is unhelpful if you think that it is wrong for Planned Parenthood to uh, change the way they conduct abortion so they can get organs and then sell them, yeah, it's unhelpful when you want to treat a human being as if it was a corn crop. That's very unhelpful, as if we were just fungible goods. But if you want to protect the sanctity of life, if you want to protect the equal equality of all human life and the rights of all people, it's essential. It's essential. And he, then he goes on to say, I urge for an undignified bioethics. Well, let's hope he's never in a position where he's the one deemed to be undignified. Because he may find out, you know, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. Well, let's go into some of uh, how bioethics takes a look at some of these issues to determine the moral value. And the, the primary one is what I call personhood theory. And the idea is that being human it does not have uh, essential value as an objective matter, but 
<clears throat> that we need to determine in a, in a uh, dispassionate way which entities or which individuals have greater value and which have lesser value. And in bioethics, that's mostly done on the basis of being self-aware over time. It's a mental capacity kind of measurement. <clears throat> so if you're self-aware over time, if you can value your own life, this kind of, <clears throat> sorry, this kind of thinking, um, then that's uh, then you're a person. And and in bioethics, for many of bioethicists anyway, some animals are persons. For example, we'll say whales or chimps uh, or pigs, and some human beings are not persons. Therefore, in bioethics, some thank you very much, Georgette. Some um, human beings have lower value than some animals. And and think about that. Think about what that could possibly mean. Sorry. <clears throat> so let me read again. I, I like to um, spice up my speeches with footnotes so you don't have to take my word for it. We'll read it from the mouth of the beast, right? This is a, a, an article called The Concept of the Person and the Value of Life. It's written by John Harris, PhD, and he goes through all the stuff, you know, all the associations and professorships. He's a very prominent bioethicist from the UK, very prominent in uh, influencing National Health Service uh, policies such as healthcare rationing and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and he writes this, and this is in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, which is one of the most prominent bioethics journals in the world, Georgetown University, Catholic supposedly. Um, so this is, uh, when it's written in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, it's mainstream. Many, if not most, of the problems of healthcare ethics presuppose that we have a view about what sorts of beings have something that we might think of as ultimate moral value. Or if this sounds too apocalyptic, then we certainly need to identify those sorts of individuals who have the highest moral value or importance. Think about this. If he said, we have to identify which race has the highest moral value or importance, we would say, sir, that's bigoted, and we would be right. But this is the same invidious thinking, just different victims. And I submit victims with less capacity to defend themselves. Because you're talking about the unborn. The, the, they are considered non-persons. You're talking about newborns. A newborn baby is not self-aware over time. <clears throat> A newborn baby cannot value his or her own life. You're talking about people like Terry Shiva. You're talking about people like my mother. And that leads to evil because it means we can treat them as objects instead of subjects. And whenever we treat a human being as an object, that's what leads to evil. That is evil. That's a good way, to me, a good definition of evil. He goes on to say, <clears throat> listen to this, personhood provides a species-neutral way of group, speciesism, a species-neutral way of grouping creatures that have lives that it would be wrong to end by killing or by letting die. These may include animals, machines, extraterrestrials, gods, angels, and devils. There's actually now a serious movement coming out of the high universities to give personhood to cyber robots if they develop artificial intelligence. So they would protect the robots and, and allow my mother to be lethally injected because of personhood theory. You can see how insidious this gets. He goes on to say, persons who want to live are wrong by being killed, not because killing is wrong, but because they are thereby deprived of something they value. Persons who do not want to live are not on this account harmed by having their wish to die granted through voluntary euthanasia, for example. I can give you two hours on why that last sentence is so wrong and pernicious. But let me give you a couple of examples of how it materially harms the welfare of society and the people who want to die. In Belgium, they now euthanize people who are mentally ill. They do it also in the Netherlands. They do it also in Canada, our closest cousins. And now, because these are people with good organs, if people consent, they can join killing with organ harvesting. I can think of nothing more insidious than telling somebody who's having a terrible time getting through the night because of anguish and mental illness that their deaths have greater value than their lives. Except perhaps society coming to believe it. And that is happening. 
elderly couples receive joint euthanasia killings in the Netherlands and Belgium if they're worried about future suffering from grief of loss of, of spouse. You see what happens when you turn away from the sanctity of, of human life, from human exceptionalism to eliminating suffering as the, as the primary directive. He goes on to say, non-persons or potential persons, potential persons, by the way, in, in bioethics ease are babies, cannot be wronged in this way because death does not deprive them of anything they can value. If they cannot wish to live, they cannot have that wish frustrated by being killed. You see where this heads. Uh, another uh, art writer, uh, Thomas B Beauchamp, or Beecham, who is uh, one of the uh, most prom prominent bioethicists, he co-authored uh, The Principles of Biomedical Ethics, which is a textbook taught to every doctor, every nurse, et cetera, et cetera, wrote, because many humans lack properties of personhood or less than full persons, they are thereby rendered equal or inferior in moral standing to some non-humans. If this conclusion is defensible, we will need to rethink our traditional view that these unlucky humans cannot be treated in the ways we treat relevantly similar non-humans. So you can see what this opens the door to. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, uh, I'm just going to have to go three minutes, uh, get the hook. Um, <laughs> I just have to, uh, I'll go through some of this stuff very quickly. Um, uh, advocacy for uh, harvesting organs while people are not dead with consent. Uh, are we ready for an, a market in fetal organs in a, by a prominent bioethicist? Uh, uh, fetal farming would be the creating of creation of cloned human beings, putting them in artificial wombs, gestating them long enough so that their organs are transplantable into the person whose DNA uh, was used to make the, the cloned embryo. Uh, that has been seriously proposed. Obviously, it's not yet happening. Um, post -abor uh, postnatal abortion, they call it, or post uh, birth abortion. That's the uh, appro um, approval of infanticide. It is argued frequently in bioethics literature. How many of you have heard of Peter Singer? Peter Singer uh, was brought to Princeton from Australia. He doesn't even have a PhD, by the way. He has a master's. And he was brought there not in spite of, but because he's the most prominent uh, proponent for infanticide in the world. And by the way, he's also the author of Animal Liberation. You can see the connection. They're now talking about... Um, starving people with dementia to death in nursing homes, if, even if they eat willingly, if the person before they became incapacitated said, I don't want to live when I reach a certain point, then nurses would be forced to starve them to death. And of course, that would just lead to the lethal injection. And by the way, in the Netherlands and Belgium, people who, are, um, who write an advance directive saying, kill me if I become incapacitated, are, le are euthanized with a lethal jab. There was one awful case where a woman was you know, just because you're, in, you're incapacitated doesn't mean you're not happy. Um, my mother had some very good times, even at the worst of her disease. And a woman, uh, the doctor came to kill her, and she struggled against it. She, wanted, she didn't want to die. And the doctor made her family hold her down, and she was held down, and she was lethally injected. And the, and the authorities in the Netherlands said, oh, well, that's not, you know, really good. But the doctor was in good faith, so no problem. That was a murder. That was a murder. Um, I don't have time to get into it, but uh, pro-lifers get out of medicine. You might want to read this from first things that I wrote, because there is now an attempt uh, to push people with pro-life views out of health care. Either that or force you to be complicit in euthanasia, abortion, and other things. Uh, health care rationing we could talk about and so forth. I'm out of time, but I want to um, end with one thing. Uh, I think you get the gist. I could have gone on for half an hour with more details, but I think you understand what's going on. This is one of the, the, my favorite uh, things ever written, and it inspires me, and I would like to share it with you. I'm aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no, tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate, extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. 
but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. And then this writer finishes with something that I think all of us can understand. The apathy of the people is enough to make every statue leap from its pedestal and hasten the resurrection of the dead. When the great abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison wrote those words in 1831, there really was no abolitionist movement. 35 years later, there was no slavery. We have the same obligation. We don't have to end a terrible institution in the way that Garrison had to work to. We have to stop a terrible institution from being into place. Thank you all very much. Thank you.